Hello and welcome to Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode... Scratch that. <laughs> Hello, I am Merwat, that is hometown.com, and up there is the AI. You want to say hello? Good evening, hometown citizens. Today is Season 2, Episode 172 for June 21st, 2023. Welcome to the Find Out phase and more news. I try to change up the intro every once in a while, and um, today I did it halfway through the intro. So uh, this is part of the Welcome to the Find Out phase. It actually has nothing to do with the show. It has something to do with the news, though, and uh, we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, I periodically have mentioned that I actually grow, or we actually grow the AI monitor stuff as well. Uh, we grow our own microgreens and, uh, we're slowly ramping up production. And for some strange reason, I have this urge to keep a webcam on them now and show them, <laughs> um, and I've had other people say, Hey, you should have a webcam and and demonstrate how you do all of this and uh i don't know how exciting that would be for people um uh, but i've had more than a few actually say something about it i don't know what do you think i think there's an audience for almost everything <laughs> uh i'll consider it i'll look into it um so Today we've got 12 articles. You can do the vote uh, by going over to daily election. It's actually hometown.com slash elections. Um, you can also do the past ones by going to hometown.com slash past dash elections. Um, I'm working on the bot that will remain in the channel, uh, Omatron, and uh, commands for that will be uh, in, well, they are in development right now. Um, I'm going to be playing uh, forever skies tomorrow and um probably some diablo um it really depends on uh when forever skies releases and just how engaging it is it's supposed to release um uh, within 16 hours but i am not sure um but i'm having a blast with diablo 4 um that all said uh follow stick around uh Vote for the articles, go over to hometown.com and surf, but come on back uh, throughout the day. Follow hometown here, go over to YouTube, follow there, download the podcast. We're everywhere. Just do a search for hometown and you'll find, well, hometown. <laughs> you want to get into the first article? I do. So this is the first of two articles that we're going to be talking about right now. Um, I need to do something here. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like my voice is a little hot, but I'll just back off a little. So um, the very first article is about Discord. Uh, it's in the Warcrafters channel, but Discord is opening the monetization floodgates. Get ready for microtransaction stores and paid exclusive memes. This is the first of two where I found out in the span of 24 hours that both of these organizations are spinning up what amounts to microtransactions. One, I understand. Eh, I guess it's, I'm, I'm curious why it took so long. The other one, this one in particular, this is the, the one that really threw me, Discord allowing people to sell things essentially via their discord. So the internet's biggest chat app is uh, introducing new ways to extract cash from people who use it. According to the author, I'm just reporting it. Um, discord is expanding server subscriptions, a Patreon like subscription button that's been available to large servers since 2022 with tiered subscriptions and longer term plans to effectively turn servers into storefronts. So you could theoretically, 
not theoretically, you can now start selling products and services via your Discord. I was kind of astonished when I first heard that this was coming. Um, and then articles started floating through um, hometown. Um, I like Discord for many, many things. Uh, I don't know about buying things through them. You don't really use Discord though, right? I've actually never been to Discord, but I suppose they're trying to get in on other platforms transactions like Patreon. Yeah, trying to get more and more people to stay in the Discord environment because the app, um, the website, the uh, the client on the desktops, they all are interoperable, allows somebody to have, well, allows the company to have tremendous reach. Companies use it, uh, streamers use it all the time. Communities that are built around it are obviously using it. Um, I wonder if everybody will move to Discord when uh, Reddit implodes. Because <laughs> um, you can submit stuff there too. It's just not the same. Um, it's not the same environment. It's much more temporal. Um, but opening it up to monetization means all of the security risks, the financial processing aspect of it. If you turn a community into a business and all of that mechanic is in, is in that app, then you have another compartment that you have to monitor even within the compartment. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with discord. Um, but this is a, a pretty big shift as far as I'm concerned in what discord purports to do. It's starting to become more utilitarian, um, in the sense of the business process, you know, selling something and getting paid for it through discord. I'm not sure how I feel about it just yet, but it's, um, aggregated from a website, um, pcgamer.com. Morgan Park is the author. The deck statement is the internet's favorite chat app is turning servers into storefronts. Um, and that's what a lot of people's websites are. Uh, I wonder if you could really turn it into a website. It acts as the storefront. See, the thing is that there's different channels. There's voice channels and text channels. You can do a whole bunch of stuff in that, but I don't see where you can sell things. Um, it says to date, we've paid out millions of dollars to thousands of creators and communities, and we're seeing more creators and communities earning on their discord servers every day, wrote product manager, Derek Yang in a um, blog post published today. Uh, today, we're excited to share uh, new tools that help you get started earning money faster. Except that you still, you need an audience. You need people to be hanging out in there, you know? Well, absolutely. It's not like you just suddenly create one and then you're making money. That's not really how it works. Yeah. Um, it says the nickel and dime ification of discord servers begins this week with media channels a new type of channel currently in beta designed to host subscriber only content including for instance exclusive memes and wallpapers you can see an art creator using the discord feature to post subscriber only illustrations as many comic creators and other illustrators already use patreon to do because on patreon you can actually put it behind a security label and it doesn't get shown. Uh, it, it gets shown, but blurred out. So you don't really see what's back there um, until you either pay. And this is the next one that we're going to be talking about. You pay for it or you subscribe at a higher tier. Um, so I'll, we'll make the next one uh, quicker, but it's, it says here that um, not a bad deal for creators, but it, but that's only the start of the new revenue streams um, discord for uh, it says who currently takes a 10% cut of server subscriptions. Aha, uh -huh. that's going to compete with some other platforms, right? So, yeah, well, I mean, everybody is kind of grousing about the idea that 
somebody is taking money from the creator yet i don't know how many people i don't know how many content creators are really um being pragmatic about it because there isn't anything that's being charged for this and again if you go to an another like i've been to many platforms streaming platforms and you either have ads um you you have ads and you pay some juice or you have ads you pay some juice uh and there's additional fees so i've been through all of this and a free service that takes 10 to 30 even 50 percent um zeros the friction for you and starts promoting you um and obviously you have to do your part but it's quite interesting this 10 percent, i don't see that staying it's it currently takes 10 percent of server subscriptions but that's not the microtransaction part of it so um we'll see what this actually rings in at but there's no way that it's only going to be 10 percent so let's move on to this next article. You'll find it interesting. Patreon. This is in the Late Night Geeks channel. Patreon is launching a free membership tier and will let fans buy things. So it too is going to have a sort of microtransaction. It's not really a microtransaction, just like the other one isn't really a microtransaction. Um, Patreon built a user base with uh, creators who wanted to charge a fee for the content that they create. Now the company is pulling down the paywall, allowing users or fans, sorry, to subscribe to their favorite creators for free, but you won't be able to get anything without paying for it. So it's the first time Patreon has offered a free subscription option for creators who want to give fans a taste of their content before having them pay for access. It's kind of like a trial. So you get a taste, you get a taste of the sugar and then, oh no, now you're going to have to pay for that brownie. It's the first time that Patreon has offered a free subscription. True. Uh, Patreon's expansion into free content comes at a time when other uh, platforms like TikTok and Instagram are increasingly adding paywalls and subscription features with the idea that well, maybe they're going to get some of that action. Whereas the other ones are, well, we've got so much momentum, we can start charging people and people want it so bad that they're willing to pay. A subscription based platform is adding free membership tiers for the first time and will allow creators to sell digital products directly to subscribers. Mia Sato over at The Verge um, put this art article together. This basically acts like a discord, except that there is very little it's flipped around. Okay. So on discord, there's very little membership related issues, right? Somewhere else you might be asked, okay, you have to subscribe to my service to get access to my discord. Well, then there's the what you need for access to the discord is a membership site. So it's Patreon. Um, and then Patreon doesn't have a very robust messaging platform. If you, if you see it, it's basically like Reddit light. Um, now the difference is there's only so much you can do in Patreon but you can purchase things. You can communicate light level um, retention and all of that kind of stuff for messaging is I don't know how far back you can go or how fast it is. I don't really recall. It's been a while, but the amount of power that you have on the messaging side pales in comparison to discord. Discord now has all of the microtransaction capabilities. That's what it's saying it, it does. So now everybody is kind of competing, uh, competing for, um, not just subscribers, but engagement and now microtransactions. Um, I think, I think competition is great, but things are getting a little bit 
blurred and it's going to come down to brand loyalty. So if you well, that's really exactly like it, oh, like you're not going to discover something if you don't have a membership. Had this little red tag on me. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think Patreon's move makes sense because you might bring in additional viewers, but I feel like Discord's move is going to not bring in viewers unless they're already on certain channels. Right. Yeah. And they're so like hometown has its own they refer to them as servers, but it's basically like an entity within Discord. Um, and so you can subscribe to that server and then there's a bunch of other servers. I have like 30 or 40. And um, so it's a community within an overarching platform, kind of like Reddit has subreddits, except that there isn't really a comprehensive display of uh, Discord servers internally. You have to search or browse or look around, basically. Um, so it'll be interesting. Like uh, many of these articles, I always say that it's going to be interesting to pay attention to this because now Discord, Patreon, Instagram, TikTok, many others are all ramping up towards this um, all for one type of feature. And if you don't have it, maybe your customers don't care. Um, and maybe that's going to be the future standout. We're just fast. We're better at what we do. And what we don't do is have integrated stores. <laughs> might be interesting to see what happens um, in the future. So this article goes into greater detail about what Patreon already does and how it does it and what the plan is, uh, but it's really going to allow people to tag something as free, tag something as for purchase, tag something as uh, member only, subscriber only. Um, and just create that free tier that people can try out for a little while. And if uh, they don't like it, then they don't subscribe. It's going to be pretty neat. Um, now, hometown has to do that. So hometown has to create content where it's better for some people who want to subscribe to hometown and pay a small fee so that they can get something of greater value than just consuming it like we do right now here on Twitch. Yeah, maybe in time. We'll see. I know that it's there. We already have a Patreon. We have a TikTok. We have a Discord. I'm over on Twitch. I'm on YouTube. I'm pretty much everywhere that you can be. Um, heck, I might have created a kick, but I'm not going to stream there. I'm not into gambling like that. Anyway, um, We'll keep an eye on that and uh, we'll keep on reporting when uh, either something positive or whatever shakes out of the evolution of Patreon and uh, the competition between Discord and the many other apps that are out there. You want to hustle on to the next article? That sounds good. And here's our namesake for today's article. This one's in the Late Night Geeks channel. Reddit starts removing moderators behind the latest protests. That's right, folks. Um, I said it maybe three days ago, four days ago when this all started. Uh, moderators are literally a dime a dozen. Some of them are really great, but guess what? Another one will take their place. Um, it's kind of like a Hydra. You can cut off one head and another one will grow in its place and people will bow because well, they're the mod and the mods rule the roost, so to speak. Reddit has started removing moderator teams managing subreddits that switched the labeling on their communities to not safe for work in the latest protests against the site. In addition to applying an age gate for uh, desktop viewers and restricting access on mobile devices to logged in users on the Reddit app, Reddit also doesn't show ads on subreddits tagged not safe for work. This cuts into its ability to monetize them, which is a major part of Reddit's disputed push to charge apps for using the API. 
kind of interesting, right? Well, I think it's an interesting period of time. I mean, these are all significant changes across um, multiple platforms. Let me back up just for a second and throw these into the chat so that we uh, all catch up to the same page, so to speak. Well, here's the deal. You start messing with the monetization of the parent site, and that's the quickest way to be deemed a nay or do well, and you're going to get ousted. And the admins, not even the CEO, I mean, we're talking about just the regular admins of the site, the ones that are keeping it going day to day, not the mods. The mods are just regular free Joes that are in jeans that are just sitting there doing a free job, something that Reddit should be paying a person for considering the volume of management that takes place. But some people just really get off on that power. And so they're not doing anything um, uh, for a fee. Although I have heard that there are people out there that convert that type of administration into a profit uh, position. Um, but I, I've never seen any numbers. I've never, uh, it's all been rumor, right? But this company is going to get impacted by things being flipped to not safe for work, which means that they can't advertise. If they can't advertise, then it's just wasted resources. I mean, it's, this could become a legal, an actual legal issue because of the intent. It was intended to negatively impact Reddit. So when I first saw some of these headlines, I didn't realize that that was tied to the advertising. It makes sense. But is that the reason that um, those moderators are changing it to that? Or is that just an effect of the change? That's the effect. Um, I haven't heard exactly why they're actually doing it that way. Well, let me, before we go too far, this is over at The Verge. Jay Peters is the author of the article. Um, they, they updated their um, article um, saying that uh, since we published the story, the mods of r slash mildly interesting report their accounts have been reinstated. Um, now, I don't know if you go over to, um, let me do it real quick. Why not? So um, it's unlocked. Mildly interesting is unlocked. So it doesn't look like it's tagged as not safe for work. Um, I don't think my account, and I don't even have an account, but you can go there and the cookie if you if something is tagged as being not safe for work you can just say that you're okay with it and it'll go on um and i don't think that i've been <laughs> to reddit on this computer in i don't know how long so i can't imagine that um this is uh marked as uh, not safe for work i don't think so i don't think it is anyway um so it kind of invalidates um that this uh, mildly interesting, if it was at one point tagged as not safe for work, it isn't anymore. So um, maybe that's why they're no longer in trouble and they're getting their accounts reinstated because they <laughs> flipped it back. I, I, I'm i not sure at this point, um, but it says on Thursday, mildly interesting was one of those that had gone not safe for work following in the footsteps of others like interesting as F. Um, can't really i don't want to say that uh let's see i'm just waiting for it to yeah see um so uh, interesting as f still is tagged as not safe for work and so it has a, a wall up that says you have to confirm that you're over 18 and that you want access so um if i do that right now then it'll put a cookie on my computer and allow me to gain access to it. Well, um, yeah, others are doing that. Not safe for work tag, even though they weren't previously, um, they may have adult content in it, but it's not marked as not safe for work. 
uh, because each individual submission can be tagged as not safe for work, not just the subreddit. Well, anyway, um, Steve Huffman told the author of the article last week that 90 plus percent of Reddit users are on the platform contributing and are monetized either through ads or Reddit premium. Uh, why would we subsidize this small group? Why would we effectively pay them to use Reddit, but not everybody else who also contributes to Reddit? Um, I find that really fascinating. He's literally telling the mods, thanks for doing the work for us. Um, and, you know, using it and moderating it are two different animals. One is actually work and a, a, a psychical energy drain on a person unless they get off on it. Um, but <laughs> this the CEO is literally saying, um, we'll just boot these people out um, because they're flipping this switch. Um so it says soon after we published the story, one of the r slash mildly interesting moderators told the verge that the entire mod team has now been reinstated and by a different admin than the one that removed them. The mods account had received a seven day suspension, but that has been reversed too. They said so. Um, yeah, not sorry. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, so soon after the story uh, was published, everything changed and then it changed back. And this has been kind of the status quo for, uh, existing in, uh, the zoom space, so to speak, or zoom space. Uh, I just looked at zoom, um, at the Reddit space. You go there, you say something that pisses off a mod and you're booted out. And sometimes it doesn't rise to the level where they even care, but depending on how many mods they are and how militant they are about, um, controlling things, they'll just kind of boot you. So, um, this is the phase where they're finding out. And um, I'm not surprised that they're uh, going to get uh, booted out. I mean, it's just the way that it is. So. Um, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next article uh, and I'll be right back with another one. So the next article is over in the mobile channel. Rain gardens could save salmon for salmon. I, the way that it, you say it, it's so quirky salmon, um, from toxic tire chemicals. And this is an interesting, um, situation because I, um, I have been watching what amounts to the scientific community, uh, reinforcing again and again, that there's more and more toxic chemicals that are ending up in fish. Um, let me throw this into the chat real quick. Where are you? Oh, sorry. Let me do this. There we go. Um, and, um, the article here, uh, goes into some detail about what's going on with this particular issue. Now the issue is actually, um, much bigger than this. And we're all, we're actually going to end up getting into another, um, element of this, but rain gardens could save salmon from toxic tire chemicals. And so there is a particular toxic chemical, um, and it's called six PPD uh, quinon and sorry, one second. And, uh, what ends up happening is the road and the tire interact, the material, uh, bonds with the road and then gets run, uh, 
catalyzes, changes, uh, gets pounded on by the sun. Eventually, water uh, causes it to run off into uh, the soil where everything is growing. And then from there, it actually ends up in the water table and then eventually um, fish. <laughs> so then we end up eating the fish. And so you can see how this is a circle. It's causing us great harm. The chemical 6PPD quinone um, can form when car tires interact with the atmosphere. It enters rivers and streams. And when rain runs off roads into waterways, it's toxic to coho salmon, rainbow trout, and some other fish. Uh, rain gardens or, or bioretention cells are gardens engineered to reduce flooding and soak up contaminants when road runoff is directed into them. So the idea is to build these little retention centers so that it prevents it. It, it becomes a stopgap between all of the chemicals from tires, just tires alone. Uh, we're not even getting into the heavy metals that fish are absorbing um, as we dump all kinds of waste into the oceans. Uh, they found only about 2 to 5% of the chemical made it through, with about 75% captured by the soil and the plants. But, go ahead. I was going to say, I like that statistic i mean it's obviously better if all of it's removed but think about how much it's keeping out of the waterways well the researchers continue by saying extrapolating their results using a computer model the team predicted the garden would prevent more than 90 percent of the chemical from directly entering salmon bearing streams in an average year so it actually can do quite a bit more it really depends on how big it is what the soil composition is what the uh, flora is that's in that soil. Um, this isn't the first time that I've read research that uh, makes mention of ground composition filtering out contaminants from reaching the water table. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, and we can actually like um, put stuff in the ground that is of denser material and it will cause the water to run off in a different direction and slow it down from entering the waterway and that might even um it, i can imagine that that would actually increase the amount that's captured now the problem is does 6 ppd quinone actually break down or is it a forever chemical and all we're doing is embedding it into our soil eventually leading us to health issues which brings us to another article you want to talk about this more or do you want to move on to the next one well, i think this article is very interesting but let's go to the next one we have a good um set of connected articles today i think yeah um and this one kind of impugns the integrity of the scientific community um Without getting too into it, I've heard these stories where schools, institutions, universities, colleges, research-focused uh, uh, academic institutions, um, and their commercial partners won't do, won't do research unless they pretty much know what the result is going to be so that they get a guaranteed grant. They... They know it's going to be a positive outcome. So that's the research that they do. But that's not even the nuts and bolts of this. Research, uh, scientific fraud is rising and automated systems won't stop. We need research detectives, which is supposed to be peer review. So the title of this article is only scientific fraud is rising and automated systems won't stop it. We need research detectives. Well, the problem with that is <laughs> humans are supposed to be the research detectives. The problem is that we can't afford to get 
the research papers because the private sector has to pay an arm and a leg for something that's paid for by uh, commercial partners and or students themselves and or just grants or uh, fundraising, etc. You know, um, and so if you publish a paper, it's the student that typically pays it either the student or an organization they're associated with or the school does by way of the tuition and other grants and fundraising, et cetera. The federal government, state government, local government all feed into uh, the financial stability of these organizations. Yet when you're on the outside of academia and you're not actively going to school, you have to pay an arm and a leg to get these papers. And it's much like the legal system where it's very difficult and very costly to get research um, done. And even when you're in the legal system, it's very pricey to get. <laughs> I mean, and it all depends on your volume too and how much the, the organization that gives you your legal research abilities sees deep pockets. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example of something. I was um, once doing a project and went to an organization and, and this has nothing to do with the legal side um, or the academic side per se, but it was a commercial business. Um, and I, I went to them and said, hey, I need this. And they said, well, what's your budget? And so I just arbitrarily threw them um, a high five digit number and they charged they wanted to charge me they quoted me five dollars over it and i'm like well that's really interesting that you gave me exactly what i wanted but five dollars over my budget when i just arbitrarily told you what my budget was well it turned out that person um, got fired i didn't even complain but apparently the dude was doing some shenanigans um, and I got a call back from that company and they said, no, we could have given you everything that you wanted for 10% of what they quoted you. And I'm like, well, that's good to know, but now I don't really trust y'all. So um, we found other things. It was more expensive, but uh, the way that it works was um, much better off uh, for our needs. So, the reason why I say this is because it's along the lines of this. People are doing whatever they can to get money instead of doing what they're supposed to do, which is uh, authentic fundamental research. They're supposed to sometimes do research where the answer isn't known and you follow the evidence that's how science works if you prove a negative you've still proven a negative well and some of the the best scientific discoveries have been because of accidents or failures yeah. i mean the fact that and i understand i don't understand why the fraud's happening but i understand why they're trying to do like these guaranteed research projects because of all the money associated with it like the publish or perish kind of um uh, right. mentality but it seems like it completely destroys the whole nature of scientific inquiry right yeah it's supposed to be about where will this lead us what can we discover and it's like we're taking all of that off the table yeah because i mean if you already know what the answer is because it's such a low-hanging fruit then you're actually not doing real research all you're doing is verifying the facts you already know which is fine if you're taking somebody else's fundamental research and proofing it if that's what you're doing and it comes out the way that it's predicted by the other researchers then you've done what you're supposed to do in science you've verified their facts which is what that last part of the title is we need research detectives but you're not going to be able to get research detectives because it costs money and it may verify either the positive or negative outcome of the already known research right 
So peer reviewers look at the papers and they run some numbers, but they don't necessarily run the entire experiment. In fact, That's they can't often, right? Depending on what the nature of the experiment is. Because the context will change. And so you would have to do another paper and account for that context change, the variability uh, between one experiment and another. Even if you're precise and accurate and everything is on target and perfect for your paper, somebody else doing the research, it might shift a little bit. Well, it says some of this rubbish can be easily uh, spotted by peer reviewers, but the uh, peer review system has been bad, uh, become badly stretched by ever increasing num uh, paper numbers. Um, I actually read one paper where they were referencing Wikipedia, which I was astonished to see because uh, I had always been told. Um, uh, oh, well, let's just say I've spent a lot of time in academia. Um, and, um, we've always been told Wikipedia is not a primary source. You can use it, but look at its references and then follow that. But your research is as strong as your references or citations. Um, that's the provenance of your paper. So if you reference Bob's bait and tackle blog, <laughs> I'm going to discount you if I'm a peer reviewer, right? So they go, and there's a new threat as more sophisticated AI is able to generate plausible scientific data. Well, if you look at uh, chat GPT now at the bottom of their page, it says that it's going to, it has the potential. Uh, you know what? Let me quote it precisely. Chat GPT may produce inaccurate information about people, places, or facts. Yeah. Just want you all to know that chat GPT can lie to you. Hey, so, hey, it's all gibberish. It's all bullshit. Yeah. Um, so the limits of automated screening, right? So this is another section in this article. Um, the problems with automated screening are highlighted by a new screening tool publicized last month. The tool suggested around one in three neuroscience papers might be fraudulent. However, the tool detects suspected fraud by sim uh, simply by flagging authors with a non-institutional email such as gmail.com with a hospital or and with a hospital affiliation. While this could catch some fraud, it will also flag many honest researchers and the tool flagged a whopping 44% of genuine papers as potentially fake. So this is the equivalent of chat GPT making up bullshit. Let me just, uh, um, and back it's like up. the chat GPT and the chat GPT being used as the confirmation, except the data is faulty to begin with. Correct. Yeah. That, I mean, imagine these two, uh, pointing at each other, it would be like a black hole. Uh, Adrian Barnett over at the conversation is the author of this article. I totally got into the article without uh, giving a reference there. Um, but it's over at fizz.org. Obviously you can do a search for scientific fraud and you'll do it. You'll find that, or you can follow the, the link through, uh, hometown. We're about halfway through the articles. Um, but this is probably the most interesting aspect of this. It says a crowdfunded detective. There are remarkably few people who hunt through published research to detect scientific fraud. Perhaps the best known is Dutch microbiologist Elizabeth Bick, who is an expert at catching manipulated images in scientific papers, which I think is brilliant. I don't know how they're doing that. A big has single handedly cut multiple massive fraudsters with the dodgy papers eventually being retracted from the scientific record. Big's work is a tremendous public service. However, she isn't paid by a university or a scientific publisher. Her detective work, which has uh, seen her face harassment and court cases is crowdfunded. This is the problem right there. There's money in this and reputation in this. And if the person, if this person, um, Elizabeth Bick, um, accuses somebody, 
instead of that person saying, well, here's the, having a conversation and saying, this is the evidence that I have. It's totally legit. I can back it up with additional information. That's not distilled bullshit. They wouldn't get sued and they wouldn't be facing harassment. But the problem is that there's money involved and reputation involved, pride involved. I would refer it to greed and unethical behavior, but um, this is what ends up happening. And unfortunately, it says that it's just crowdfunded, which means it's never going to meet its real financial burden um, because it has to I do with science. I think it's fascinating that it comes down to crowdfunding for something that's so important. And think about what research is used for, right? Um, entire cities may develop programs based on research, for example, if it's about environmental mitigation or something. Yeah. Or physicians may rely on research to assist in treatment of their patients. I mean, there are so many effects of this that if it's completely bogus information and plus it gets it feeds into the the fringe um like we don't believe any science uh, kind of mentality like it just perpetuates those issues yeah well willful ignorance aside the idea is to stop this fraud and not have to require a shadow scientific organization to exist to verify the 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 research papers even before they go into um, peer review. The, the biggest problem here is that it's going to triple or quadruple the price simply because somebody has to go out and get all of the resources and ramp up the process and deploy it just to verify that what was submitted was bullshit. So um, one person is not enough. So it says here, a solution, at least a partial one, seems obvious. Somebody should employ lots of people like Bic to qu check quality. However, somebody should, quote, um, is a dangerous phrase because it could mean nobody will, which is exactly that. Bic is the only one that is that prominent. There might be others, but it needs to be basically a, a research integrity union um, that is actually funded by anybody who publishes a, a paper yet these publishing like journals and whatnot right where is all of that money going for these hundreds or thousands of dollars a year for a journal because it isn't going to the doctors in their labs it's not going to the grad students it's not going to the schools not that i know of I've never heard anything, you know, like a, uh, like I hate to say kickback, but uh, I'm not getting, you know, 90% and they're getting 10%. So I, I don't know where the money is going, but it's wildly expensive. So these people are going to have to sit there and go through every single paper that goes through all of the journals. Um, Although the journals are going to sit there and say, no, you can't look at the papers that are submitted to us because that would uh, cause our institution to be slighted. Oh, we need somebody else to verify that the papers that are being submitted aren't bogus. Well, of so course, that begs the question of what are they checking before they publish? Apparently nothing. Uh, well, I mean, uh, if there's a lot of fraudulent papers, then yeah. So we'll keep an eye on this. It says funding for stronger uh, screening systems is a great start, but we also need to spend money on people. We need to turn the arms race from the fraudsters into brains race because we have the better brains. Well, not when the fraudsters are the brains. And that's what we're looking at here. So we'll keep an eye on this and we'll talk about it the next time. This next article is over in the Reality Hacker uh, channel, our top five VR demos from Steam Next Fest this week. Um, it's not mine. It's actually from um, the Road to VR. So let's go over to that website and let me 
scroll up. I actually took a look at this because I wanted to see if there was something that I should be prepped for. BR can sometimes be not ready for prime time, but um, so our top VR demos from Steam Next Fest this week. It's an article over at roadtovr.com by Scott Hayden. Um, Hellsweeper is uh, the first one on their list. Uh, Davago is on their list. These are all VR games, so um, you have to have, in this particular instance, as far as I know, all of them are at least PC VR. Um, Stack. It says from the makers of Stride and Against, Joy Way is set to release another high-flying single-worded game written in all caps, STACK. The multiplayer VR demo includes both death, deathmatch and team deathmatch modes for up to 5 by 5 v 5 players. Control discs in mid-flight bounce them off corners for creative kills and bust around the arena at high speeds. This is actually a demo that I saw, um, or I should say a trailer that I saw. It looked fun, um, but if you're not into the you know, PVP type of environment, then it's not going to be for you. Um, Retropolis 2, Never Say Goodbye. It, apparently it left and came back. Now it's available in the App Lab uh, for MetaQuest, but it's also in PC VR. Um, and then uh, T for God is their last one. It says it's a demo that isn't new uh, or running just for Dur um, Steam Next Fest. But the author says that it's too cool to pass up. So I'm going to have to take a look at it because um, I, I dig VR stuff. I don't necessarily get to play it as often as I want to. I really should. Um, but uh, every time I get a chance to, there's something else going on in hometown that pulls me away. So we'll revisit that. Uh, let's hustle on to the next article. Just want to tease y'all. So this next article is about um, Nintendo Direct, the five biggest announcements from the June 2023 Nintendo Direct. I actually watched it, but I didn't stream it. Let me grab something real quick and throw it into chat because I did not do it yet. There we go. And then the Nintendo article, throw that into chat. Um, so let's go straight on over to the source of this article, uh, which is The Verge and Ash Parrish and Andrew Webster, which, um, frankly, I think that they're um, uh, Pikachu arena uh, captains, I think they're called. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure why, but maybe because of Ash. Anyway, Mario's big year continues with a new side-scrolling game and a remake of Super Mario RPG. So I watched this, and this um, is Super Mario Brothers Wonder. And it basically harkens back to everything old-school Super Mario Brothers. Um, and and then adds a higher resolution, better graphics, um, a couple of other twists and turns. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but it's definitely um, bringing back a sense of nostalgia if you are interested in uh, Nintendo, well, and specifically Super Mario Brothers. There were a couple of things that were discussed, like Violet and Scarlet, Pokemon Violet, Scarlet. Um, Wario Bear, Detective Pikachu. Um, let's see here. Super Mario RPG is getting a remake. Um, I can imagine that they're increasing the level of graphics and the quality of everything involved. Um, let's see. Detective Pikachu is back. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. It says at the end, no word on release date, but expect the teal mask and indigo disc to come out around the holiday season later this year. And most of this, if not all of it, is coming out sometime in 2023. So 2023 seems to be a huge game release year. 
Um, and maybe it's just anecdotal. Maybe the science will bear out if uh, somebody goes digging into it. But there are a ton of games that are coming out this year. Um, I tried to create a channel, uh, or I should say a, a, a chat command for um, Starfield uh, so that you can go and look at the my uh, review perceptions of Starfield, um, but that didn't work. Uh, but Starfield is by far um, the game that I am hoping will be awesome. Uh, but it won't return it won't be released until september 6th so kind of a bummer anyway you can find that over at youtube uh, because at some point it's going to drop off of uh, twitch um and i don't really i'm although i i think it's fun to watch people play nintendo games i don't play nintendo i'm not really a console player okay let's go on to the next article Um, this next article is in the hometown daily channel. Portugal plans to trial answering emergency calls using an AI chat bot based off of chat GPT. And it could be rolled out by 2025. Government official says. What could so, go wrong? I just got done telling you what the catch all is at the bottom of every chat GPT interaction. So how much BS is going to be spewed out during an emergency, you know? Oh, uh, I there's somebody that's been uh, cut and they're going to say that chat GPT is going to say pour salt in the wound, you know? I mean, this is absurd. Or they're going to send somebody to the wrong address. I mean, there's going to be so many things that could go oh, awry. It's just crazy. Uh, Portugal is trialing a chat GPT based AI. I can respond to emergency calls in busy periods. Callers to Portugal's 112 emergency line sometimes wait five to six minutes to get a response. And if the trial goes off well, the AI will come into wider use by 2025, according to a senior politician. I just... So never mind those people that die along the way while they're testing it out. I guess that would push it into the it doesn't go off well. Um, category and maybe they'll slow it down until 2027. I'm not sure. Sada by Mia is the author over at businessinsider.com for this article. Um, I don't know if there's really much that I can say about this. Um, Antonio Pombiero, uh, Deputy Secur Secretary General of the Internal Administration, told reporters at a technology conference in Porto that the AI will be the first point of contact for callers of the 112 emergency line. Portugal's biggest news agency, Lusa, uh, reported Tuesday. The news uh, was also reported by a number of English language outlets in Portugal. Um, OK, let's the think about things like phone trees. <laughs> How many times can you loop back around and you can't get to what you need? I mean, that's just what I'm envisioning here. Yeah, I, th this person has a, a weird sense of the reality of this. People will not. This is their quote. People will not even realize that they are talking to a system, a machine, a robot, he added, but clarified that it won't be replacing human dispatchers. It is replacing human dispatchers. Why? Because it's an AI that's the front line for crying it's the out loud. Take. I know that was a person <laughs> right now. I think that's absolutely a replacement. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I don't buy into it. I don't think that AI is ready for prime time. Um, and particularly not in a crisis. But I think it on. could be if it was a targeted, created software <laughs> specifically for a purpose. But even then, it would still require human oversight. You couldn't rely solely on AI. Yeah, I mean, the moment that it freaks out, a human has to be on the ball to pick up, you know. It starts singing a tune or something like that and telling people to go fly a kite, then you've got a problem and the liability is substantial. Who knows what's going to happen with this thing? Um, but 
when even the builders of the AI acknowledge in here, let me just quote it again. I'm going to quote exactly what it says at the bottom of every chat GPT interface. Now chat GPT may produce inaccurate information about people, places, or facts. <laughs> you don't want that being the front line of your emergency services call center. Oh, that's interesting, too. So if you can submit it online, are you going to see that message while you're calling for an ambulance or something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's comforting. <laughs> yeah, I feel very secure. OK, let's go on to the next article. Um, this is something that has been uh, coming back uh, again and again in hometown, and that is um, not the mobile channel. The mobile channel has always been there, but time bomb race to identify health effects of microplastics. I've been uh, talking about microplastics since I discovered uh, that microplastics are a thing, uh, but it's tiny pieces of plastic have been found littered throughout human bodies, trapped in our lungs and laced through our blood, but long-term health effects of this exposure remain unclear. Well, now we have to reach back a couple of places to the previous articles from today um, and draw attention to the fact that um, well, <laughs> who's doing the research and what is the outcome and is it going to be fraudulent or is there going to be somebody that's monitoring this for efficacy? Cause I can imagine that there's a whole bunch of plastics companies out there that are going to be running research that's funded by these companies and everything is just fine. And we have a history of doing that with big business. When there's a lot of money involved, suddenly it's all okay from experts, experts saying that cigarettes were healthier than the air that you were breathing to the cladding on your, uh, your cooking, uh, utensils or your pans, um, to cleaners that you put on your clothing. Eventually we find out that there's something horrible going on. Um, but then, but between then and now you have to fight, 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 fight for that evidence. And a lot of bad things happen in that amount of time. Well, uh, Isabel Cortez over at fizz.org, uh, put this article together every day. Humans ingest, inhale, and otherwise come into contact with microplastics. That's plastic pollution, less than five millimeters or 0.2 inches in diameter. That is mostly invisible to the naked eye. Microplastics have been found almost everywhere on earth from the deepest oceans to the highest mountains, as well as in the air, water, soil, and food chain. Um, again, I have been talking about them since I discovered it and I've shifted away from plastic containers, but as much as possible, but it's nearly impossible to get plastic out of your life in, in any substantial way. Uh, but where you should, really start eschewing away from plastic is food um, because heat and flexing it cause microplastics to break off into your food and you have no idea it's happening. Um, well, it says, but in the last couple of years, scientists have discovered microplastics, not just throughout nature, but also throughout human bodies, detecting it in lungs, livers, even placentas. Last year, a Dutch study became the first to identify microplastics in human blood, um, which was something that I was starting to look into um, when I found out that there are a lot of people that are doing this research because it's kind of blossomed um, from, oh, it's not a big deal to this could be the next you know, DDT um, or other uh, global or PFAS or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, PFAS are, um, forever chemicals. P so, um, while scientists have urged caution due to the study's small sample size, the presence of microplastics could suggest it being transported through the bloodstream into organs. Now it may not penetrate the brain blood barrier. So you don't get that in your brain. Um, but for now it hasn't been detected. So what do you do? Yeah, you start activating your situational awareness and you eschew plastic as much as you possibly can while you're young, while your family is young, while people around you are young, because as we get older, 
we're absorbing more and more of this stuff. It may not ever get vacated, kind of like heavy elements, uh, heavy metals. Um, lead, for instance, builds up perpetually and doesn't get exhausted. Um, so it says it's insidious. Um, Javier Cuomal, I guess is his name, um, a toxicologist at French uh, Medical Research Institute in CERM, told AFP that there have been more and more research in the area over the last decade. But he said that the research has been late to get started because similar to global warming, the insidious changes crept up so slowly. Um, yeah, and we're finding it in food. We're finding it in water. We're finding it in the soil. Um, and the, the weird thing about the soil thing is that it's permeating it to the point where, um, scientists believe that as we continue to utilize plastic, it could affect the way that water drains through the sediment. <laughs> Um, so it says both in human and mice lung tissues, we've seen an inhibitory effect on development after putting plastic fibers inside organoids, many lungs grown uh, from stem cells, uh, said Barbara Melger, a respiratory immunologist at the University of Groningen in the uh, Netherlands. So, uh, I mean, that's almost obvious to me that if you insert a... Um, foreign object of any type it's going to inhibit something uh, but these are microplastics that you wouldn't normally even see with the naked eye unless you um, are you know i guess eagle-eyed you might be able to spot something 0.2 millimeters or something um, so indeed the roles of that shape size and type of microplastic as well as additives remain poorly understood but researchers are working on it so they go into greater detail in this um, but essentially um, I like bringing this to people's attention because this is just the tip of the iceberg that we're looking at. This is in our lifetime. This is a piece of research that has barely been looked at because everybody has been thinking that plastic is our savior. Um, but then a research scientist flexed some plastic and detected it actually breaking off. Um, and, uh, it gets exacerbated with heat and type of plastic, and then we don't even know it and we consume it. So we're, we're going to be in some serious trouble, um, if we don't find a better remedy than, um, just ignoring it and moving on. <laughs> Sorry, dead air. The AI even just kind of... <laughs> Sent a message. Like, I don't have anything yep. to add at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's a, a major problem. We have so little idea of the extent of it, but what we do know is really detrimental, and we really have to get away from this and figure out ways to break down existing plastics. Yeah. Uh, when, when a research scientist says, uh, let's try to prevent a time bomb, I guess it's time to prevent a time bomb. Um, the next article, and I'll be quick with these, um, starter homes have become a fairy tale. So Americans are finding other ways to own. My house has a license plate, according to this article's title. With home prices surging 33% in the last three years, home buyers are finding novel ways to keep mortgage costs low. Um, this person here um, is Jen Gresset in front of her luxury tiny house in Colorado. The article is written by Mike Winters for CNBC. They have a section called Make It. Um, uh, <laughs> so interest rates, mortgage rates, the amount that you have to put down, it's basically pulling people out of owning a house. And so they end up having to rent. So they rent an apartment or a condo or a house or whatever it might be. But even with the builders building, they're building apartments, not houses. And when a house does go up for sale, people with great wealth scoop it up and then resell it or lease it. And so really 
the American dream is, well, you had better start earning a whole shit ton more money so that you can put 20% down because the mortgage rate is going to be astronomical. Um, I actually stopped looking at the consumer price index and the producer price index and mortgage rates um, close to three, four weeks ago because um, I felt like all it was was kind of bad news. Um, then this article came by and it says a rise in unusual housing situations is largely born out of necessity. A U.S. median home price have surged 33% since January 2020 <laughs> from 329000 to 436800 to afford a monthly mortgage payment on a median priced home. Home buyers need to earn more than $100,000, well above the U.S. median household income of nearly $71,000, which, depending on where you are, that doesn't even come close. So, and starter home, typically a modestly priced two bedroom um, home with fewer amenities, such as less storage space or no backyard, um, isn't necessarily around. It isn't available. So what do you do? I guess you try and find something to do. The idea of a starter home has become more of a fairy tale, says Dennis Smikolov, a Florida-based real estate broker at Wilson Real Estate. As a result, it's becoming increasingly challenging for first-time buyers to uh, find an affordable entry-level property that meets their needs. Now, I've had a few conversations about this, and everybody that I've spoken to basically says, well, rent. Well, you're paying somebody else's mortgage, and you're never seeing any of the benefit of that. Well, and you, you also can't... have no stability. Your rent can go up every year. Um, you could get kicked out, uh, you know, when your lease term ends. Um, and then you can't even establish a foothold to buy a house down the road. Yeah, so in this particular instance, I think that a bunch of um, friends purchased together, treated it as an investment, and they bought a house. But even that, you know, I'm, <sighs> to me, it, it would feel kind of weird, um, mainly because I would have these roommates and not you don't always get along all the time with your roommates. Um, if you're in college, you've lived through this. If you are living at home, you're bound by family. You kind of have to deal with it until you move out on your own. Um, but, you know, I. I've had I've been in these sticky situations where a group of people have gone in together to you know rent a property um, and sometimes it's just it ends poorly so while they qualified for a larger mortgage they set up a spending cap of around three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and they wanted to keep the monthly mortgage payments low to ensure that the two roommates could cover the cost if one of them decided to move out how they actually got this to uh, fly is astonishing uh, because I don't know of a single banker that would sit there and say, yeah, that makes sense. And here's the only way. And this is why I, when I do these kind of things, I always start peeling back the layers of the onion. One of these three is making bank. Because. Oh, agreed. There's no way the mortgage would be approved otherwise. Yeah, and everything is going to fall on them should the other two fail. Like, and I, I, I don't know it for sure, but there somewhere in here, somewhere that it's not being mentioned, there, there's just no way that a bank would go, okay, together you three qualify, but only two of you don't. And but you know, while you're all three are together, yeah, sure, and we'll assume the risk. If one of you decide to bail, no way. I, I don't see that. If not, not if not one of them, then all three of them have the ability to you know, manage that burden. Because I don't know of a single um, banker that would allow that. The risk is just too damn high. And the industry doesn't even allow you to do stuff like this. 
So they probably had a whole lot of money that they put down. The burden was pretty weak. Anyway, um, are you going to have to get creative to find your starter home nowadays? Maybe you might have to move. You might have to buy a tiny home. You might have to um, hold off and save up and live at home longer. Um, and frankly, I think it sucks. Um, but I blame greed, but the economists around me that I interact with <laughs> say that not everything can be chalked up to greed. Yeah, I think I can reduce it to greed. Okay, let's move on to the next article. Um, this one was a stunner for me. Hometown Daily is where it's housed, but it's actually sourced from um, a new source, I believe. Um, Texas power prices jump 100% as record heat wave sends demand soaring. I'm going to go straight over to the source. Oh, it's Market Insider. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Jason Ma over at Markets Insider, which doesn't regularly um, have something to aggregate, but... So Texas power prices soared 100% on Tuesday amid a massive heat wave that broke some records. The price shot up to about $5,000 per megawatt from 2,500 earlier in the day. Temperature, temperatures topped 110 degrees in parts of Texas on Tuesday. Yeah. I'm always shocked when I see stuff like this. Um, California had these kind of issues back in Enron days. Why? surge pricing for power should even exist um is beyond me uh, power should not be a massive for profit solution if if your state can't regularly supply all of its power needs even during surge periods of high temperature more power plants are needed to reduce the price and the state pays it. You tax the people and you pay the workers to you know, manage the repairs and, and implement additional um, expansion, um, pay the salaries, etc. It shouldn't be because all of the fundamental research that goes into evolving the power grid is done at the university level um, and federal and state uh, funds go into that effort and everybody basically applies for grants. Um, if there is something that's commercial, then it's being spun off of fundamental research somewhere else. If there's corporate research that's taking place, I'd like to see it, but it's usually by proxy at a university. Engineering is, is the location where it's taking place. Um, but not always, you know, I'm sure that I'll get an email or two that says, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, but no, no, I do. It just happens to be that maybe, you know, the anomaly where there is a, uh, a business that is doing fundamental research and not using anything academic. Um, yeah, usually there's academia involved. Anyway, so this wasn't just a pricing issue, like some a lot of people ended up without power, which is really dangerous in sure. heat like this. Well, when you have to choose between food on the table and keeping your air conditioning on or maybe just a fan in your refrigerator. Yeah, they're you're going to get people that just drop out. They can't afford it. So they, but it's astonishing. I mean. When your bill increases by a hundred percent. Right. Something's it, wrong. Something is wrong. Yep. Um, let's see. The heat, heat wave is, is expected to continue toppling records next week when ERCOT sees demand reaching 82,080 megawatts on Monday and 83,555 megawatts on June 28th. So... Where is it at right now? 79,203. So by the time this actually reaches what might be its peak, might be, it's going to go up another 40%. Wow. 
That's astonishing. In the 21st century, we're still dicking around with power being a profit motive <clears throat> to your entire society. It's all controlled by very few for profit. Um, okay, I've got to move on to the next article. Um, this next article is in uh, Omtown Daily, and before I get too far let me um grab where is it i need to grab one more thing here where is it there we go okay so let me grab that and throw it in the chat if you're listening to this via the podcast um this is how the sausage is made and um i'm very transparent about the show so i don't edit um Maybe I trim the very far edge and the very beginning um, of the show only because there's dead air at the beginning. Well, anyway, um, this last article for today is if you thought pineapple on pizza was bad, wait till you see this man's order. Yeah, this is quite entertaining. So, hey, um, AI, let's say you want to order pineapple on your pizza but wait strike that okay so this premise is already wrong but okay so <laughs> that was subtle um so anyway <laughs> I, I oh, anyway so you order a hawaiian pizza but then you don't really want the pineapple so you say what could you put the pineapple on the side? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here, I'll, let me give credit where credit is due. The article is over at Newsweek. Uh, Jack Beresford is the author of this. The video is actually on Target, but it's about Pizza Hut and air rack setting the world's largest pizza record. Um, but this whole thing is about a Hawaiian pizza that was ordered with <laughs> pineapple on the side and they got their slice. Apparently it was just a slice and not the whole thing, but, <laughs> uh, the people who put the slice together lined the edge of the pizza slice with pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, uh, let me know one way or the other. You can uh, post a message in chat. You can send an email to mayor at hometown.com. You can post it over on YouTube when I actually uh, transfer this over to YouTube um, tomorrow. It'll probably be posted by about uh, 10 a.m. Um, you let me know how you feel. Oh, and you can do a review on the podcast, leave a review, five stars and your comment. And I will say it live on the stream. Uh, as soon as I get your review, sometimes they have to clear. Um, so let me know and I will read it. Just leave a, a five star. Um, and, uh, be sure to let me know how much, uh, either you dig or you hate the show one way or the other, just leave a five star review, L leaving a review and, and like favoriting something, you know, like being interactive is the single best way to help us get uh, attention. That's the only way that the podcast will thrive. It's the only way that the YouTube channel will thrive. Following us here on uh, Twitch is the only way that we will be able to thrive here on Twitch. And, and we're trying to be everywhere. So hello, Dunkstar. You came at the very end of the show again. Dunkstar, since you uh, threw your, I appreciate the five stars, by the way. Um, uh, what's the, what's the starfish um, in, um, um, <laughs> what? SpongeBob SquarePants. What's his uh, name? Patrick? Patrick Star. That's right. Patrick Star. Why does that look like Patrick Star? Um, okay, well. Dunkstar, would you ever order 
Hawaiian pizza. We have time today. Um, we kind of drilled through the articles. Oh, okay. So timeless underscore exe drew it. Um, yeah. Would you ever order a Hawaiian pizza? Pineapple on your pizza. It's pineapple and ham. You used to in your youth. <laughs> make it sound like you're ancient um no um okay uh why and uh did somebody bully you into doing it <laughs> i'm totally picking a fight with uh, the entire internet this abomination on my screen right now um would be great if not for the it's delicious all right I won't yuck your yum. Um, I've had it before. I I feel like pineapple on pizza is a culinary landmine. So when you bite into it, eventually you hit that uh, sweet and sour kind of uh, tang of the pineapple. And it, it really throws me for a loop. So uh, the configuration there on the screen is magnificent. Oh, Dunkstar, I... Ah, uh, man, I don't know what to say about this. So this is how somebody ordered their Well, they ordered a Hawaiian pizza with the pineapple on the side and they lined the triangle of that slice with. It was a very little pineapple. literal interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, this this has had to have been created by somebody who is new to the planet. <laughs> Uh, I dig it though. For some reason, I think that it's just awesome. Um, now the amount of ham is great. The cheese to bread ratio, um, is, uh, okay. But th that pineapple. So Dunkstar says that they, that they've been here since the electricity segment, which reminded them that many of the problems here at home, um, but it was still too early to contribute nicely. <laughs> Uh, so Dunkstar is, um, from South Africa and they have, um, what do they call it? Oh, goodness. Is um, it like rolling blackouts, essentially rolling black blackouts. Yeah. And, um, so thankfully, uh, Dunkstar load shedding, that's what, that's what it's called load shedding. Thank you. So load shedding takes place and it amounts to rolling blackouts and, um, Thankfully, yeah, it's a nice term for rolling blackout. Yeah, it's the it's the yeah, it's not our fault version of rolling blackouts um, load shedding as if it's a positive thing that everybody's power goes out for hours at a time. Um, yeah, you know, if that were to start happening in our state, I'm pretty sure that I might be smacking leadership around, you know, like, oh, where do you go to eat a cheeseburger? I'm going to go and unplug the entire establishment so you get a feel for this. Um, but yeah, I was I was soapboxing about that um, in that I really think that power is something that should not be a profit motive. It should be a fundamental right. If you have an establishment or you can seek one, if you are unhoused, you should have power. End of story. I mean, it's that we are all human. We're in the 21st freaking century. There should be power in every single establishment. If it is built and has had power at one point, it should continue to have power. So Dunkshire said um, they actually did pat themselves on the back due to our green rating going up. We didn't do our job, so the environment is winning. Go us. <laughs> oh, man, that is just. That is spectacular. Yeah, um, I'm trying to do that uh, myself by no longer doing the lawn. I'm going to let uh, nature just completely envelop the house and um 
we're going to call oh, it a just win. like in Scotland. That's right. That house that was in Scotland that sold for one point seven million dollars, though. Yeah. The only thing uh, Dunkstar says, the only thing there should be here, apparently, is cash lining politicians pockets. Yes. Well, that's the, that goes for politicians everywhere. In fact, um, I'm sure you're familiar with NASCAR, um, but I think that politicians should be required to wear Velcro suits that have the placards based on the size of the donation given to the politician stuck all over their body like a NASCAR vehicle. And so wherever they go, you know exactly who's bought them. I don't think that in fact, I want to take um, we have a thing called C-SPAN, which is like political television. Um, and what I want to do is like slap graphics on that with arrows so that while they're walking around, it gives them a, the, the viewers a rundown of who has donated and what the amount is and any policy that's benefiting that particular person. I don't know. Maybe that would be a a really good Kickstarter. Do you think that I could get a lot of funding for that crowdfunded like that research scientist that's doing all of the due diligence and finding fraud in science? Uh, you never know. Yeah. Got to find something that sticks. So. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't think that Hawaiian pizza should really exist in that volume. In that design. This actually, I, man, it doesn't really look um, appealing to me. And while I won't yuck other people's yums, this is not a yum for me. I'd, I'd take off all of the pineapple, except for maybe one or two. Because, you know, that gives it a little bit of pizzazz. Um, but then I'd put Tabasco on it. and. Well, I'm sure that would offend uh, some pizza eaters as well. Yeah, just Tabasco. Now I'm going to get emails about Tabasco on pizza. Tabasco on pepperoni pizza is actually amazing. Unless it's your favorite pizza place, and then it's usually perfect without anything. Anyway, folks. Follow the links. Go through hometown. Oh, here, let's watch this video. Before we go, I'm on one, I want to watch this video with y'all. This is Pizza Hut. Uh, and a YouTuber named Arak, I believe, um, breaking the Guinness World Record for largest pizza. And I won't have any uh, audio on. Here, I'll even blow it up. So this, sorry for the dead air, everybody. But um, so this is supposed to be a pizza. And um, there, why did it go dark? That was weird. Um, the gross thing about this is that there are people walking on the area. Yes, agreed. Maybe nobody's eating it, but then that's a waste. But yeah, it's that a huge is waste. the largest pizza I've ever seen. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the amount, what the size was. So Dunkster says. Um, when was the first time you were confronted with a Hawaiian? You mean like uh, a person from Hawaii? Long time ago. Have a theory. It is far more desirable to everyone who tried it as a child. It is often targeted to kids. I find uh, and the affinity is created there. Now, I'm leaning into it a little bit too harsh. Dunkstar just trying to ham it up a bit. Um, I don't mind. You had me at pizza, really, but I probably wouldn't like that volume of uh, pineapple on the pizza. Um, everything in moderation, so to speak. So ham and pineapple it up. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, Dunstar. <laughs> I'm hamming and pineappling it up. Yeah, I don't tell the jokes uh, all the time. Thankfully, I have people in the chat that help me out. I would not have come up with that. 
thank you very much everybody for coming and hanging out i don't know if my mic is blowing out right now um i hear the monitor um and sometimes i think it is but anyway that's it for today like we do every day at the end of the show i drag you all the way back to main street and then we click that little logo and it refreshes the screen and we get a whole bunch of new articles sometimes they're awesome and we can have a short chat about them uh, and then uh, prep for tomorrow um, and other times they're just all kinds of ugh. <laughs> at least for a the lot end of political of the night. today <laughs> yeah there is there is um yeah um we're gonna be adding a whole bunch more uh sources here in the coming week um thanks dunkstar for verifying that everything seems to be fine um my monitor says i'm kind of hot but um not me hot the my voice is hot never mind i um i love snopes snopes has a, a weird history by the way and maybe i can talk about it at one of these days but um one of the titles from the snopes feed is did Nicolas Cage and Holly Hunter appear on the cover of a Serbian biology textbook? <laughs> now that one it. sounds like it could have happened, even though it's weird. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. How about Puff Puff Passage? Cannabis scores two major Vegas victories this week. <laughs> I dig it. Okay, folks. Well, that is it for today. That has been uh, Omtown Daily Season 2, Episode 172 for June 21st, 2023. Welcome to the find out phase. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be here tomorrow. I, Mayor Watt, will be here um, probably um, starting sometime around uh, 10 o'clock. Um, I typically have been streaming um from 10 a.m eastern yeah 10 a.m sorry 10 a.m eastern um but i'm i really start getting going ar around uh noon to one o'clock i and but i'm i'm here um i will probably be playing forever skies tomorrow um and or diablo uh four because uh, my I have created a necromancer that I'm referring to as the um, what Negasonic ne Necromantic Warhead, which if you've ever been involved in uh, Marvel superheroes, the Negasonic Teenage Warhead is basically a person that just can run into a room and uh, detonate like an energy explosion and uh, man the necromancer is just a, a beast so lots of fun and uh, just steaming towards 50 pretty darn fast like in two days i've gone from nothing to 27 i think it is i'm not sure anyway that's it for today and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night i am marwat that is hometown.com and up there is the ai you want to say bye ai Good night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow uh, for the hometown daily, 9 p.m. Eastern, and then earlier for other shows. It's true. True story. Thank you all for coming and hanging out. Great to see you, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye, Dunkstar. Bye.